Wednesday we talked about electrodynamics and we talked about that being the study of moving electric charges as opposed to electrostatics being stationary electric charges. We talked about what we had to have in order for electricity to flow. And that was that we had to have a conductor. That conductor was something that allowed electrons to flow and we used um, wire, metal wire as a, an example. Uh, usually we use aluminum or copper more commonly and a better conductor would be copper. We talked about insulators and insulators are things that disallow electrons to flow. So they stop the flow of electricity and we've got plastics and we've got rubber and we talked about that. Um, we talked about semiconductors and uh, one, one thing I did fail to point out is that in wire you've got uh, metal wire so electrons flow through the wire but the insulation around it, usually rubber or plastic, uh, prevents those electrons from, from escaping and then creating a, a short circuit. So in the, the example that I used with the electric fence, um, the, the plastic kept those electrons from escaping the, the, uh, the electric fence wire and shortened out the whole thing. So the purpose for the, the, the electric wire being covered with some sort of insulator is to keep the electrons in. So they disallow electrons from flowing out of wire into um, anything else that would, would cause a short circuit. So then we've got semiconductors and semiconductors we'll talk about again later on. Uh, sometimes they allow electrons to flow in, and sometimes they allow electrons to flow in one direction and not in the other. And then we've got superconductors which are just very efficient conductors but to make them superconductors they've, they've got to be kept very very cold because we talked about resistance and the different things that we can do to affect resistance of wire. So we had the size of the wire, the length of the wire, um, and the presence of current provided resistance itself. And that resistance manifests itself in heat, so if we kept the conductor very, very cold, then it removed that heat, removed some of the resistance, and we got superconductors. And we use those in MRI. So we talked about electric current, or electric circuit, and what we have in electric circuit is flow of electrons, to power something that we can use. So the, what, what we have in, inherent in every electric circuit, in order to make the electrons go, we have voltage, the flow of electrons, what we'll call amperage, and then resistance is set up in the wire, and we'll talk extensively about resistance um, next week, whenever we talk about the, the last portion of this chapter. But resistance measured in, in ohms are uh, inherent in, in flow of electrons. So we have movement of electrons being the amperage, the movement provided by the voltage, flow of electrons being the amperage. So we talk about Ohm's law being V equals IR, and again, it's a simple equation. So that what we have is voltage is equal to intensity, and intensity is amperage times resistance, and resistance is measured in ohms, and the, the measure of ohm, or the, the symbol for an ohm is that. So it's the omega. So um, in V equals IR, what we have, again, is simplify the equation, one times one equals one, so that you can see that if you increase your resistance, your voltage is gonna go up. If you, it has to go up because you've got more resistance, so you gotta have more voltage to push those electrons down the wire. So if your amperage goes up, then you double your, your amperage on the same resistance, then your voltage has to go up too. We also had another one, another equation, and that was electric power measured in watts was equal to intensity, which is amperage, times voltage. So we could kind of do the same thing, but in this, what we saw was that uh, for the, the same power rating, what we could have is a manipulation of amperage and voltage, so that if we increase uh, one, the, the, the other decreases uh, to maintain the, the same power. So if we had one equals one times one, and 
and we wanted to maintain the same wattage, if voltage increased, then amperage had to decrease proportionally. So they were in inversely proportional. And inverse proportionality applies to all of these uh, where voltage remains the same, intensity and resistance are inversely proportional, but voltage would be directly proportional to increase in just one of those. So if we, uh, in this case, had an increase in, in amperage, then our voltage had to go up. Um, and power rating is, is a rating of our uh, X-ray imaging system, so the transformers, uh, and the, the textbook refers to them as generators, and as high voltage generation, it's not truly generation, generation is generating electricity, and we're generating uh, high voltage, so it's really transformation. So don't, don't get tripped up on the difference in those words. So anyway, that's uh, Ohm's law and uh, power ratings. Then we talked about, the, again, the electric circuit. So we had to have a complete circuit, so we had to have a positive end and negative end. We talked about uh, the positive flow of electrons uh, coming from the positive end of the uh, battery or whatever it, uh, you know, was the power source for our electrons. We talked about what resistors were and uh, said that resistance and resistors are not necessarily the same thing. It's just that resist, resistors add resistance. So a resistor can be anything. It can be electric motors or an induction motor is a, a type of resistor. Our x-ray tube is a resistor. The filament is a resistor. Light bulbs are resistors. Anything that you put into an electric circuit so that you can use the electricity flowing through the circuit technically is a resistor. So um, resistance is just inherent in the, the circuit and certainly whenever we add a resistor, we increase um, resistance. So electric power, we just talked about that. Generators measured in, in electric power. And that brings us up to where we're gonna start today. And today is going to be all about uh, magnetism. So we're going to look at, at magnetism. We're going to take this all the way up to page. We'll go through page uh, first half seventy nine or seventy five, rather, right? and then we'll finish up on Wednesday with uh, how the generators work and um, the the transformer laws and all. The effects on voltage and amperage. So, uh, magnetism was an accidental discovery, as are a lot of things. Um, and the the story that he relates in the textbook, uh, there's some question as to whether or not that actually happened the way he said it did. But uh, you know, you, you can draw kind of a parallel in this area. You walk across a, a muddy. Um, lot and we've got so much red clay in this area that if you you walk across the dirt chances are by the time you get from one end of the the lot to the other you've built up some some clay on the bottom of your feet and kind of the same thing happened um according to this story and that the the people of the time of the era that magnetism was suspected of being discovered their sandals had metal um, studs in them that caused the, the uh, leather to, to hold on. So they didn't have the stitching we have now. They had little metal studs. And let's say they're, they're walking across this area and there's uh, like a metallic surface that they might not even been able to see um, on the surface of the dirt. And when they got to the other side, they look at the bottom of their sandal. And what they see is a buildup of stuff. And it wasn't clay like what we see here it was instead metal shavings. So um, the, the metal in their sandals attracted the metal shavings off of the ground, which became the foundation for um, the understanding of magnetism. His, Bouchon is a character. He's, he's a funny man. And the, the look, you know, don't, don't use this as a, as a serious example, but his, his little, statement that uh, when they milk the cows, uh, the cows
cows gave milk magnesia. It's not milk magnesia as in the milk magnesia that you get out of the bottle whenever you got belly ache. That's milk that came from that area that's called magnesia, and therefore it's milk magnesia. It's a bad joke. It's it's a dad joke that he felt obligated to, to put into the textbook. So it's they didn't get milk magnesia. So uh, magnetism, how magnetism works. Uh, we get magnetism from a couple of different ways. We've got natural magnets, which is what was discovered in the example that he was given. But anytime that we have a charged particle in motion, we're going to get magnetism. So back to our circuit and our conductors and our amperage and voltage. So if we have a flow of electrons going through a wire, electron carries a charge, a negative charge. So if we supply extra electrons to this wire, then the, that's a charged particle in motion and what it demonstrates is a magnetic property. A single electron is not gonna give you a lot of magnetism, but it will give you some magnetism. And it's a, the foundation for how MRI works and it's a foundation for how it is that we're gonna create um, high voltage and low voltage. So, Electron in motion, charged particle in motion gives us a, um, a magnetic property. If we have enough of those stuck together, we can create a, a level of magnetism that we can actually detect and use. The problem with magnetism is two things. There's some similarities between magnetism and, and gravitational pull. As a matter of fact, it's one of uh, electromagnetism is one of the four fundamental uh, forces. So you got two forces inside of the nucleus of the atom. That's a um, strong nuclear force which holds everything together. There's weak interaction which actually allows the nucleus of the, the atom to fall apart in radioactive decay. There's gravitational pull and then there's electromagnetism. So what we're focusing on now is, is the magnetism in electromagnetism. So, the, the problems that, that we see with magnetism uh, and how we can detect magnetism is it's very difficult to detect without having something to detect it. So what you have, in, have to have in order to detect magnetism is something that is affected by magnetism. So uh, let's say, um, you know, in this magnesia area, People have been walking through there for eons with uh, footwear that was just rags tied around their feet. There's nothing in, in place for them to detect those small filings of, of, uh, of metallic magnetic material until somebody came in with, with some shoes with some uh, studs in them. So people were walking around on magnetism for maybe centuries before it was actually discovered. So something had to be there to discover it. You can't feel it. You can't feel magnetism. If you ever go back to MRI, uh, you, you might get a placebo effect thinking that you feel magnetism. You don't really feel magnetism. So you can't really feel it. You have to have something there to detect it. That's number one. It's not easily detected unless you have something in place to detect it. Iron, a compass, something. You've got to have something in order to detect it. That's number one. And number two is, if I were to take a magnet, and a magnet has two poles, it's got a north and a south pole, and the, uh, the, the way the magnetic field lines run is out of the south end and into the north end like that. So, it, and it's, I can't draw three-dimensional, but um, that's reaching out all, all different directions. So, if I were to take one of these, and this is a magnet, then your magnetic field lines are extending like, I don't know which end is north and which end is south, I can't tell. But they're, they're extending out three-dimensionally all the way around this, coming out of one end and going in the, into the opposite end. So, when you have a magnet close to something metal that it can detect it very easily, then it's easy to detect the magnetism. But those magnetic field lines extend out indefinitely. And we talked a little bit about this a few weeks ago in the, um, you know, just the, the theory of sound. And that is that the sound in, in x-rays with the 
Inverse Square Law, reach out indefinitely and they never stop until they hit something. And sound never completely dissipates unless something makes it stop. So that if you could isolate sound from 100 years ago, you could actually still pick it up because it's still vibrating molecules. The uh, same thing applies here to magnetism. There is no minimum unit of magnetism because these magnetic field lines right up next to the magnet are very, very strong. But the further out they go, the weaker they get. It's kind of like gravitational pull. If you remember talking about uh, the planets, I, I guess I can take that off. I'm in here alone. I'm used to wearing it. If, if you remember when we were talking about the planets, the uh, gravitational pull on Pluto and the, the furthest planets out was very, very weak, but it was still present. And the same thing happens with, with magnetic field lines is that the further out they reach, the weaker they get, but theoretically, they never go away. So this magnet right here, this magnet is putting a, a, a pull on iron thousands of miles away. It's just so weak, it's never gonna draw it to itself. So there's no minimum unit of magnetism. There is a, minute, a, a minimum amount that you can generate. And that would be if you've got an electric circuit and you send one electron down, you're gonna create a magnetic field. That magnetic field is going to be extremely weak and you're not going to be able to detect it but it's there but even with that minimum amount it's going to reach out indefinitely so again no minimum amount of magnetism based on the fact that that reaches out forever the minimum amount that you create is the amount that comes off of one electron that's very key. One electron is very key in this uh, segue into uh, magnetic domains, uh, magnetic moments. Any material with unbound, or I'm sorry, unpaired electrons demonstrates magnetism. A pair of anything is two of that thing. So any atom that has unpaired electrons, we've got a nucleus with one proton, and if it's got one electron, and it only has one electron, it's unpaired. If we had, and that would be hydrogen, if we had two protons, that would be a helium nucleus, and we've got two electrons, and what happens is that the, the magnetism that comes off of each one of these, because they're screaming around the nucleus in all different directions, cancel each other out. So it doesn't demonstrate any uh, magnetic properties, but hydrogen does. So if we had three protons, three protons, then we would have three, should have three electrons. And if we have three electrons, again, we're unpaired. We've got a pair plus one. So we've got an unpaired electron. So again, we're back to magnetic uh, properties. If we have four protons, again, we got paired. Uh, electrons, no magnetism. So unpaired electrons, uh, uh, atoms with unpaired electrons demonstrate magnetic properties. And this is a foundation for MRI. And I think we talked about this a bit in that uh, the most abundant element inside of your body is hydrogen because the most abundant compound in your body is water. So water is made up of two parts hydrogen. So each one of those hydrogen molecules, even though it's sharing electrons with the, um, the oxygen, it still has unpaired electrons. So we've got one proton, one electron, and the hydrogen demonstrates a magnetic property. Again, it's too weak for you to detect, but if you put two magnets, you take one magnet, let's see if I can make this happen without dropping one, you take two magnets and you get them close enough together, they join, right? So you put hydrogen inside a magnetic field and the magnetic fields have a tendency to line up either with or against magnetic field lines. So they join up like so. So hydrogen, magnetic property, because it has unpaired electrons. It's got only one electron.
So when we're talking about magnetism um, and the uh, amount of magnetism that we can create, again, that single magnetic property in a, in a single hydrogen atom is undetectable. We've got to get a bunch of them together in order to have a, a useful amount of magnetism. And what we call this is electron, the, the mag magnetic property created by that electron is what we call electron spin. And it creates what we call a magnetic moment. Okay, so it's an unmeasurable amount of magnetism for our purposes, but if we get enough of them together, then what we can have is a magnetic domain It's kind of like a compound of something. We've got enough of it to uh, demonstrate magnetism that we can actually use. Magnetism can be created inside of something. Uh, so you got a bar of, of iron, just a big chunk of iron, and iron uh, is susceptible to magnetism, meaning that we can both create a magnetic field in it and eventually we can make it magnetic. Uh, all by itself, even if it's not magnetic. So if you've ever used a power drill, and you've got a power drill and you've got a drill bit on the tip of it, and you're drilling through metal, then what you'll see as you're going through metal is the, even if the, the drill bit did not start out as magnetic, it will end up as magnetic. Uh, likewise, if, if you're using a power drill to drill in screws, and it slips and it starts banging around on the head of the screw, it takes some of the shavings off of the screw and then it becomes magnetic too. So it becomes magnetic because of the trauma um, that, that's undergoing and the, the banging around that's happening. And what you've got there in a piece of iron is maybe your magnetic moments are pointing all around randomly and they don't really, you know, they're, they're not paying a whole lot of attention. So if you take to, to each other. They're just going all over the place. Uh, there's no rhyme or reason to it. And if you were to take a hammer and hammer on this thing enough, or if, let's say, this is not a bar, bar of iron, but it's rather your drill bit, and uh, it because it's banging into to other pieces of metal, what will happen is that these magnetic moments will line up so that they're facing in similar directions, in you know, one direction or the other. So some of them may be you know, still pointing off and doing their own thing, but enough of them will line up so that your magnetic moments join together and create a magnetic domain, and now you've got a measurable unit of magnetism. So uh, electron spin gives us a magnetic moment. Magnetic moment, we join enough of them together, we get a magnetic domain. Right, so we already talked about the magnetic field lines. They stretch out indefinitely. The smallest uh, magnet, magnetic field that we create is uh, with one electron or one unpaired electron even. Um, but uh, that's, that's not real useful for us. Uh, magnetic permeability. So we've got two things. We've got magnetic permeability and we've got magnetic susceptibility. And they kind of go hand in hand. Um, an element that is susceptible to magnetic, uh, the influence of magnetic field lines is also permeable. So you've got a piece of iron, again. So you got a piece of iron. Iron is uh, both susceptible and it's permeable. And I, if I were to take a magnet and put it close to the uh, piece of iron, the piece of iron in this case has not been traumatized by a drill bit, uh, hadn't been beaten on by blacksmith hammer, which does become magnetic. Uh, it's, it's not magnetic. It, 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 even though it's susceptible and it's permeable, it's not showing any kind of magnetic properties. If I take a magnet and get close enough to it, what will happen is these magnetic field lines will reach out and it'll go through the uh, piece
piece of iron and make it magnetic, kind of like the paper clips. I put this down under the paper clips, and now they're magnetic. Um, they if, even if I only attach the the magnet to one, it's only touching one. It's going to hang on to more of them because they become magnetic. The iron is permeable to the magnetic field line. So the magnetic field lines reach out and grab it. And if I put a piece of, and this is just iron, if I put a magnet up against it, the magnet by itself has magnetic field lines that are going out and around it. But if I put a piece of iron right up next to it, and what I'm gonna have is the magnetic field lines go out and they go through the iron itself. So then now they reach out even further. So I've got basically a bigger, stronger magnet. So it is permeable. Anything that is permeable means, uh, you know, like a permeable cloth uh, would be something that's got a lot of holes in it so water would go through it. Magnetic field lines go through something that's permeable. So it's susceptible to becoming magnetic, so therefore it's permeable. But also some susceptible materials can be made magnetic and be made into a permanent magnet, uh, not through permeability, but through the trauma process that we were talking about before. Again, the blacksmith hammer, because he's beaten metal on metal, um, will become magnetic after a while. The screwdriver bit uh, may become magnetic if it slips off the, the tip of the screwdriver. The um, drill bit becomes magnetic because it's, you know, it's rearranging the, um, the atoms inside while it's, while it's drilling. So it's, it, you know, there's tra traumatic effect going on there. So be, through uh, susceptibility, a non-magnetic material can become magnetic permanently. Uh, through permeability, it can become magnetic temporarily. If I take this magnet away, then I put it down here. Again, because n no unit of mag uh, the, the smallest unit of magnet magnetism is, is not existent. We don't have a smallest unit. We're still going to be reaching out and going through this. So technically it's still permeable and it's still drawing the lines of magnetism. It's just so small that for our purposes, we're going to say it's not magnetic anymore. It's still permeable. We move it close to it and it starts to demonstrate magnetism. But if we pull it far enough away, then uh, it really effectively for, for what we can detect, it's no longer magnetic. All right. So, uh, there are four different fundamental types of, of uh, material whenever we're talking about um, the ability to, to draw in and concentrate lines of magnetism. And that is your permeability. Permeability is just that ability to draw in and, and intensify the lines of magnetism. So what we have are non-magnetic, which goes right against what I was just saying, four types of material that demonstrate magnetism, non-magnetic, uh, totally ignores magnetism. Anything that's non-magnetic uh, doesn't, is, is completely unaffected by magnetism. So we've got non-magnetic, non we have paramagnetic. And paramagnetic, I'm gonna get back to in a minute, but it's a weakly attracted uh, magnetism. We have ferromagnetic material, and that's a strong attraction. So we've got a very strong attraction between ferromagnetic material and magnetism. Again, we're back to iron. If I were to try to pick up this mask with the magnet, I got nothing. Right? The only way I'm going to pick up the mask is to stick another magnet on the, on the opposite side of it. Now I can pick it up. But otherwise, there's, there's nothing. It, it completely ignores it. So I've got paramagnetic, non-magnetic, ferromagnetic, and the last one is dimagnetic. Dimagnetic is a, um, uh, a repulsion. And we don't really 
to see that because there's no such thing as a strong repulsion to magnetism. You just don't see it. Um, water, though, is a, an example of something that is uh, diamagnetic. So, you know, you drop a, a magnet in water and, and you just don't see the water split. But paramagnetic is something altogether different. And some things that you see as being weakly attracted, or non-magnetic is actually weakly attracted. Aluminum. Aluminum, you know, if you put a magnet on aluminum, it should be aluminum, there is no attraction to it. So I put the magnet up here, and it, whoop, it falls right off. Obviously, there's some iron in the board itself, but in the, uh, in the framework, there's nothing. It won't stick. It'll stick there, but it won't stick up here. Nothing happens. So uh, the, the best place I ever saw a demonstration of paramagnetism was in MRI. And the, uh, if you've never been back to MRI, a few safety things that I think have been covered, but they bear repeating, is that if, if, you've, if you've got any kind of metal in your body or on your body, especially if it's a um, something that's ferromagnetic, you know, if you've ever taken some metal shavings to the eye, for example, you don't want to walk into MRI. So uh, MRI is a big magnet, and what we measure magnetism in is Tesla. And Tesla is just a representation of magnetism. Earth's magnetic field is measured in Tesla. And our MRIs, the, the uh, magnetism inside the MRI is exponent, or it's quite a bit, probably exponentially uh, stronger than the, the magnetism in the Earth. Um, so it may be three, four, five Tesla in an MRI unit. And so the magnetic field lines going through the magnet, magnet are so thick that things that you think are not magnetic can demonstrate magnetic properties. So you walk in, make sure you got your credit cards out of your pocket because it will clear your credit card. Uh, your strip won't be effective anymore. Your chip is probably going to die. Make sure you take your phone out of your pocket and leave it somewhere else. Um, all metal comes off of your name tags, everything. So we're talking about the MRI, he takes this piece of aluminum, it's about the size of this book, and it probably weighs uh, maybe 10 pounds. So it's a sizable chunk of aluminum, and he sets it up into the, the bore of the magnet. Uh, so it's, it's sitting right there um, at the entranceway of the magnet, and it's standing straight up and down. And he, he's talking to us, and he the, the MRI tech that was working there at the time was talking to us and he reaches over and he just taps that piece of aluminum and it falls, but it doesn't fall like that. The magnetic field lines going through there are so strong that it has an actual effect on, on the aluminum. And instead of falling like you would expect it to fall, it takes it, I don't know, five, six, seven seconds for it to actually fall all the way, all the way down. So extremely, heavy field of, of magnetism running through that that actually shows the, the paramagnetic uh, properties of aluminum. Again, this magnet's not strong enough to demonstrate that up here. It just won't happen. It just won't. There, there's not enough magnetism for me to demonstrate that that is actually weakly attracted to magnetism. I can't demonstrate it. So, uh, non-magnetic, diamagnetic, uh, ferromagnetic and uh, paramagnetic are four types of material. Uh, there are four laws that um, that describe magnetic behavior. And they sound exactly like what we talked about in um, electrostatics. So I take I think you can see the table. I take two magnets, two magnets, and I put them 
at a distance from each other. Remember, there's no minimum unit of magnification, so they're pulling on each other, or they're pushing on each other, one of the two. Um, but there is interaction between the two. It's just not strong enough to draw them in. But if I take, take one magnet and I move it closer to the other one, we'll see what happens. Okay, so what we've got there is that, again, I don't know which, which end is north and which end is south on this, but what we've got are opposite ends. So the magnetic field lines, again, are predictable and they exit through the north end of the magnet and enter into the south end of the magnet. So what we've got is north and south. Magnetic field lines go that way. All right, so actually if, if you were to, to walk to the North Pole, if you were standing on the North Pole and you had a, a compass that was uh, capable of, of picking up the magnetic field lines and pointing in any possible direction, it would be pointing straight towards the sky. So it goes out of the top end of the magnet, uh, out of the north end of the magnet and into the bottom end of the magnet. So that if you take a, a second magnet and you brought it close enough to it and it was oriented in the same way so that the north was facing the south end of the next magnet, those magnetic field lines would again be coming out of the north end of this magnet and into the south end. So if you put them close together, then these magnetic field lines are just gonna join up with those and go through the middle of it. You got a bigger, stronger magnet. In that way, opposites attract. Now if I turn one of these around and we do this again, then you should see that if the magnet, one of the magnets was turned around, I say this one was now south end and north end, our magnetic field lines now are going out the north end and into the south end. So they're going that way, they're pushing that way. These magnetic field lines are coming down here and once I get them close enough together, they're gonna to bump into each other and they're, they're not gonna interact well. So, light charges, now we've got south facing south. What you're gonna see is a repulsion. So I get them close enough together, I can actually push them apart without ever touching. So you can see that they get, I don't know, what is that, inch and a half apart, and they don't like it. Okay. So opposites attract, like charges repel. Just like in electrostatics, like charges attract, or like charges repel, opposites attract. All right, so that's number one. Um, number two is that, again, when we have one electron, one electron, one electron, then we, and it's moving, then we can have a magnetic, uh, magnetic moment. We can have, you know, we've got spin, we've got magnetic moment, we've got a, a unit of, of magnetism, but it's not enough to use. So our laws of electrostatics work that if we have more electrostatic charges, then we have more electrostatic force. Well, in this case, if we have more uh, individual units of magnetism, so we have individual magnetic moments and we join them all together, then we can create a magnetic domain. So the more magnetism we have, the more we have, the more we have, just like in electrostatics. And the third law is, again, a two-part thing, and that is magnetic pole strength is directly proportional to the product of the, the, uh, the individual magnetic moments and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them, which is just Coulomb's law applied to electro uh, or to magnetic fields. So again, your uh, laws of magnetism are really the same as your laws of electricity, and that is why it is one of the fundamental forces of electromagnetism. And that's where we're camping out today. So magnetic induction uh, is what we were talking about just a moment ago. With, uh, 
magnetic induction, what we can do is we can induce a magnetic field in something that's non-magnetic. So if it's susceptible, if it is permeable, we've got a bar of iron and we take a, a magnet and we put the magnet close enough to the bar of iron, so we put it right up against the bar of iron, then what we will do is induce a magnetic field through the iron. So what we've got, once we get the magnet here, is we've got those magnetic field lines, now we're going through both of these things uh, so that what we've got is a bigger north and a bigger south and a magnetic field line goes through both of them. So the iron becomes magnetic. It was susceptible, it was permeable, we can induce a magnetic field in the iron. So again, we got magnets, we've induced a magnetic field in the paper plates. I really intended to end the recording there, uh, but we're only at 40 minutes, so we got a little, little extra time and maybe it'll make it a little um, easier lecture on Wednesday. So how did we learn that electricity and magnetism were really two portions of the same force? Again, by accident. So now we're on page 75, and if you look on uh, page 75, right-hand paragraph, it runs into a, uh, uh, a story about um, a guy named um, Galvani. So his name was Luigi Galvani, and he was uh, working in his lab, and he made an accidental dis discovery. You may have seen this in AMP. Um, our uh, neuro, neuro, neuro system, our, our nerves work off of electric impulses. So when, if you ever go to surgery and you're working on a neuro case, maybe they're fusing a spine, maybe a neck or a back, uh, what you might see in the room at the time, depending on what the patient's, uh, um, what what, what the patient's condition is like is you may see a, a person that sits kind of to one of the lateral walls and they've got this little bitty machine, they got these wires that go under the machine, under the drapes, and into the patient. And what that person's job is to do is to run electric impulses through the patient's body while the patient's asleep, while the doc is, is doing uh, the surgery. And what the impulses will do is they'll give a measurement of how well the patient's nerves are reacting to what the doctor's doing. So it, it kind of freaks you out the first time you see it because you'll see a patient, you'll, you might see their legs, uh, not, you won't see their legs, but you'll see the drapes over the legs and all of a sudden there's a lot of motion and it's just twitching underneath and you think the patient's waking up so you have a tendency to tell somebody, hey, you, you know, the patient's moving. Uh, it's the, uh, potential monitor person that's stimulating the nerves in the patient's legs. So they're running a small current through uh, the patient so that it, it makes their legs twitch. So your nerves work off electricity. So Galvani is in his lab and he takes uh, and just accidentally touches a frog leg with two materials that are of dissimilar metal. And the frog leg jumps. And y'all are all too young to, to know this, but um, back in the day when we had fillings, the fillings were actually metallic. And so they drilled out a, a cavity and they put a filling inside your tooth and it was, it was a metal substance that they put in there. And metal um, didn't cause a problem. It was all the same metal. So when you chewed on things, if two of your teeth came together and they both had uh, cavities and that were filled, there was no big issue. But if you have two different types of metals, certain types of metals, and they come in contact with each other, you'll get an electric current. So juicy fruit gum has aluminum foil on the outside of it. And sometimes if you weren't paying any attention, you'd be 
unwrapping a piece of gum and you pop it in your mouth and there's just a little bit of that foil left on it. And you would know that you had foil left on it whenever your tooth that had the, the filling came in contact with that aluminum foil because it hurt something awful uh, just for, you know, split second. So dissimilar metals will give an electric current. And a lot of discoveries lead to innovations. So um, Alessandra Volta took what was observed with the twitching uh, leg and he, he decided that, well, we've got dissimilar metals and we cr can create uh, electric flow or electric, some sort of electricity with those dissimilar metals being in contact with each other. So he took them and he stacked dissimilar metals together and created the first battery. It's what we call the voltaic pile. They're much more complicated than that now. Uh, what we have in batteries now is a, an alkaline material. So we've got a rod down in, inside of this goo that, that creates the electricity. So we've got a, a positive end of the battery and a negative end of the battery with this rod that goes all the way through it. And the electricity actually comes not really from the dissimilar metals, but from uh, alkaline material inside that uh, is affected. But the first battery was just a stack of dissimilar metals um, and that, that gave a low voltage current that uh, we call the voltaic pile, it's the first battery. So we couldn't tell that electro, electricity and magnetism were two parts of the same fundamental force until we had some electricity that we could actually generate and study. So we got that. Uh, twitchy leg, uh, frog leg led to the creation of the battery. Creation of the battery led to um, what we refer to as Orsted's experiment. Now, whether or not it was truly an experiment or a yet another accidental uh, finding is up for debate. But what Orsted had was he had a source of electromagnetic or of, of electric flow. So he had electric current, probably from a battery. All right, so we have positive, we got negative. He had a circuit. And what he had in the circuit is, is maybe a switch. We'll put the switch over here. And a switch is just like a light switch on a wall. It's a way of opening and closing the circuit. So with an open switch, what that means is you've got no electric flow. You've got uh, a break in your line somewhere so that the electrons that are trying to flow can't go anywhere. But once you close the circuit, then electrons can continue to flow. All right, so electrons are flowing. But he also had a compass. So let's say the compass was situated right here, and it was pointing towards, like compasses do, magnetic north and he had everything set up, but his switch was open. So he had an open circuit, no electron flowing. And the, the uh, compass was pointing at north as it should. So we've got compass pointing north, south, west, and east. Now, so he's got it hooked up to the battery. Everything's good. He closes the switch turns it on, and what he observes is that our um, compass, once the electrons started flowing through the wire, pointed at the wire. So it no longer pointed towards north, it pointed at the wire. So it's pointed at the wire, and he realized, and well, probably not right away, but let's say open the switch again. So he turned off the, the flow of electricity and what he saw was that it pointed back to north. So what he concluded was that when we have a circuit and we've got electrons flowing through the circuit, electrons being negative charges, we've got a charged particle in motion because it's going, then what we're gonna create is a magnetic field. So a charged particle in motion creates magnetic field. And not only that, but what we find is that the, the magnetic field is going to be perpendicular to the flow of electrons, all right? So this gets a little bit confusing. 
um, but what that means is that if you're looking at the cross section of the wire, so you're looking straight down on the wire, magnetic field is pointing, you know, it's, it's flowing out of that coil wire, or that, that wire pretty much in all directions. So the, the electron is coming towards you and magnetic field is going out in that direction. Okay, so perpendicular flow of the, the, uh, um, the uh, flow of electrons or the movement of the charged particle. So you can determine uh, what, how the electric field is gonna be set up by what, what they call the right hand rule. So the right hand rule says that if you were to grab the wire, and I'm gonna do this, but if you were to grab the wire and point your thumb in the direction of the electron flow, you could predict exactly how the, the uh, magnetic field lines are set up according to the right hand rule. So magnetic field is gonna be going like this around it, perpendicular to the flow of electrons. So that was Orsted's experiment. Michael Faraday, he came along and he built on Orsted's experiment and he said, okay, well, that's all well and good. You can create mag magnetism with the flow of electrons, charged particle in motion creates magnetism, but can magnetism create electric flow? And he found out, yes, it can. So a few things about the flow of electrons through a, a, a circuit like that. And it goes back to the laws of magnetism. So if you want a bigger, stronger magnet, what you do is you, you join up magnetic domains, right? So if you have one doma magnetic domain, you got a weak magnet, you put two of them together, magnetic field strength goes up. You put four of them together and it goes up even more. So what we can do to strengthen the magnetic field, because it's gonna be a very weak magnet, but what we can do to strengthen the magnetic field is overlap magnetic fields. And we could do that in a number of different ways. If you were to take a second circuit and come around it, then that would work. It's still weak and now it's taking up a lot of space. And since it's weak, we can put another one around it, right? And we could keep on doing that until we have this massive collection of wires in a circuit. Or what we can do is instead of adding more and more circuits and more and more uh, sources of electromagnetic or of, of electric potential, that's what a battery is, is a source of, of electric potential. And instead of doing that, if we had, again, a source of electric potential and we were to run it through a circuit but instead of making the circuit square, taking the wire and coiling it around like so, now each one of these uh, coils becomes kind of like its own magnet so that magnetic field is reaching out um, and instead of just going around the wire itself, it reaches out and it's kind of like taking two magnets and putting them close together. Now, so these, these two magnets join up but this one wants to join in the fun too, so it joins up. And now what we've got is a magnetic field that goes all the way through this and it intensifies the magnetic field and makes it extremely strong. So that's the foundation for electric, uh, electromagnets. You send uh, a uh, flow of electrons through a wire and it's a constant flow of electrons through a wire, but you coil the wire up and what it does is it takes all that electric all that, those individual magnets, it's like taking individual magnets and joining them up together to create one great big strong magnet. All right? So again, along comes Michael Faraday and he says, okay, we can create magnetism with flow of electrons. Can we create a flow of electrons with magnets? And so he experimented. So what he did was he took, again, a source of, electro, of, of electric uh, potential so we've got a battery, let's say, and he's, he, uh, uh, let's, let's back up a little bit. Let's, let's make it just a little bit more simple. He says, okay, can I, can I make electric flow with a battery or with a, with a magnet? And he takes a circuit and it's not a circuit, but it's connected to a, a, uh, a device called an ohm meter, ohm meter. 
that with the ohm meter you you can uh, detect electricity, electric flow, current. You can detect voltage. And he takes a magnet. So this is not an eraser for the moment. It's a magnet. And he takes, you got your ohm meter, and let's say it points at zero. He takes a magnet and he moves it over close to it. And what happens is he can see the needle on his ohm meter move. So it, it no longer points at zero, it might point at two, let's say, just for a number to use. It points at two. So it moves the magnet over, and what he sees is that it gradually increases until it gets to a maximum of two. And they, he says, wow, that's kind of cool. But he stops, and as soon as he stops, it drops back to zero. So uh, what, what happened? You know, did this thing die? So he picks it up and he, you know, does, does this number with it. But whenever he picks it up, what he sees is it jumps back over to two until it gets it far enough away. And he's, he's astonished because he's looking at electric current again. But as soon as he, you know, he, he gets shocked and he looks at it, it drops back down to zero. So what he concluded was that, yes, you can make electricity with a magnet but what you have to have is a change in the intensity of the magnetic field as it relates to the circuit. So when he brought it close to the circuit, again, what you had was a very weak magnetic field out here. It's getting stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger, strong gets. And as soon as it stops moving, it stops changing. There's no fluctuation in that magnetic field. But what happens is my ohm meter increases, 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 very intense, but as soon as it stops, it drops back down. If you move it back away, it goes straight back up to intense and it just slowly starts moving back down to zero again, uh, the further away it gets. So in order to create electricity with magnetic field, what he found was the magnetic field has to be changing. It can't be, um, stationary. It can't be a static magnetic field. You can't just take a magnet and slap it up next to a, uh, a circuit and expect continuous flow of electricity. It's got to be moving. So how can you move the magnet? Well, you can, how can you make that change, the, the change in magnetic field uh, strength? It turns out it doesn't really matter if the magnet's moving or not. Uh, the magnet can move coil can move or the, the wire can move, something's got something's to change. The, the, the key here is the magnetic field lines and their uh, interaction with the wire has to be in fluctuation. So what we could do is we can move it in and out like that and that's going to change it. We can move it up and down like that and that could change it. We could sit here and we could spin it around and around like that. That could change it because by spinning it, what we're doing is, if this is the north end of the magnet, magnetic field lines are coming in, uh, going out, right? Going out. And coming in the, the south end, but if I spin it around like so, then the exact opposites happen. They're going in and they're coming out the opposite end, so we've got a fluctuation. So we can move it this way, we can move it this way, we can spin it around and around like that, we can alternate it back and forth like so, or we could take the coil of wire, this, the circuit itself, and move it instead of moving the magnet. The key is the magnetic field has to change in relationship to the wire. And then we can create electricity with a, a magnetic field. It has to be changing. So if you look on page 78, just a, a, um, a circuit like that is not gonna create a whole lot of electricity. But just like we can increase magnetism by overlapping the magnets, if we take this, this flat wire and we were to coil it up, then we've got a couple of different things going on. We'll use magnetic field to create electricity and the, the amount of electricity that we can create with that coil of wire intensifies. Now we're creating a flow of electrons which in turn creates a magnetic field. 
So again, we can move it this way, we can move it this way, we can stick it in the, in the center of the coil of wire and we can run it up and down through the coil of wire itself, we can spin it around and around, we can move the coil of wire, it doesn't matter. It's just that we have to, to change that magnetic field. So carrying that into Faraday's law, how much electricity can, can we create with changing magnetic field? There's four laws. The strength of the magnetic field, the, the, the magnitude of the induced current depends on four factors. The strength of the magnetic field, all right? So if we have a weak magnet, we're not gonna create a whole lot of electricity. If we have a very, very strong magnet, we can create much more electricity. So the strength of the magnetic field, the velocity of the magnetic field as it moves past the conductor. So again, we got a magnet. Move the magnet over close, it moves the needle. We stop, it goes back to zero. We leave it there for a minute and we're creating no electricity. After a minute, we move it, the needle moves, and then it stops. We leave it there for a minute, we bring it back, needle moves, and it stops. All right, so I'm not gonna create electricity for much of that minute just when the magnet's in motion. But if I keep the magnet in motion constantly, whichever way we're going with it, if I keep it in, in motion constantly, then I create more electricity. <clears throat> so, the velocity of the magnetic field as it moves past the conductor. Move the magnet faster, create <coughs> more uh, electricity. That's number two. Number three is the angle of the conductor and its relationship to the magnetic field. I really don't have anything for you for uh, understanding that, just memorize that portion. But the other thing is the number of turns on the conductor. So if I were to take this coil of wire and double the turns, then what I'm gonna do is create likely twice as much electricity. So how can we increase the, the amount of electricity we create? those four things. Stronger magnet, move it fast, coil the wire up a whole lot, and then that other thing, the angle uh, of the, the magnetic field of the conductor. I think we're gonna pull up there. Uh, actually, real, real quickly, um, electromagnetic devices is, are just anything that um, electricity uses um, and we can convert electro, uh, electricity to magnetism, magnetism to electricity, uh, both to uh, any other kind of energy, like um, two examples. One, a windmill, mechanical energy, is what a windmill or a water, water mill uh, uses. So what you've got in a windmill is you've got this generator which is inside this housing, you got these great big blades that stick off of it. And um, it's kind of like a reverse of a fan in that a fan is an electric motor that turns blades. Um, a windmill is basically blades that turn electric motor. Um, and the difference between an electric motor and a generator is just, it's, it's insignificant really. One takes mechanical energy and creates electricity. That will be your windmill. The other takes electricity and creates mechanical energy, and that will be electric motor. So just the same thing, just kind of wired in exactly the opposite of each other. So in a windmill, what you've got is you got wind that catches the uh, the blades and it turns the blades, and the, the turning of the blades is as if you're taking a magnet and turning it inside, and you really are taking a magnet and turning it inside of a coil of wire so that the coil of wire and the, the changing magnetic field, you're taking it and you're just cranking it around like that, and a coil of wire is going all the way around this thing, you're just cranking it around and around, you're creating electricity. That's how a windmill works. Water mills work the same way. Uh, electric motor um, works exactly the opposite in that you're, you're inputting electricity and you're outputting um, mechanical energy, so electric fan. The kind of motor that we use is an induction motor in x-ray creation. So the only mechanical portion, the only portion of our x-ray tube that uses mechanical energy 
is the rotor. So if you're looking straight down on the end of the x-ray tube, what you're going to see is, is the rotor, right? And then the, the x-ray tube itself is shaped kind of like, uh, kind of like this. So you're looking straight in on it like that. So you get the rotor here. Uh, the entire assembly is called the rotor. So outside, right out here, what you've got is an induction motor. And I draw this in a very simplistic way so that you can uh, kind of um, uh, differentiate the, the magnetic fields. And I'm actually just going to put three so that they don't interact with each other. So we've got three different magnets on the outside. So we've got one, two, and then another one somewhere in front of or behind the, the x-ray tube. And the, the rotor, this thing here, has to have a piece of ferromagnetic material in it. The whole thing can't be ferromagnetic uh, because then if we turned on one of these, then the whole thing would be attracted to it. We don't want the whole thing attracted to it. We just want a small portion of it attracted. So if I turn on um, this electromagnet, so what I do is I run electric current through that. Charge particle in motion creates a, a magnetic field. So we got electric current running through our, this coil of wire. And that's all this is, is coil of wire. I send electric current through it, and because it's coil of wire, I've got a very strong magnet, and it draws that around in that direction. Now, if it gets to right here, and I turn this one off, and I turn this one on, then it's going to continue to rotate, so it goes from zero to 3,000 RPMs in a matter of about a second. So these things fire in a specific sequence so that it's continuing to drag that piece of of ferromagnetic material that's inside the rotor around and around and around. It's kind of like you take a magnet and you take the magnet and you run it around real fast. It's doing exactly the same thing. It's just dragging that piece of ferromagnetic material around in a circle. So that's an induction motor. And the reason we call it an induction induction motor is because I'm using electromagnetic induction using electrons to create a magnetic field to induce a magnetic field in this piece of ferromagnetic material to draw it around in a circle. Induction. Induce a magnetic field in this case so that we can get rotation, we can get a torque, we can get rotation of the anode. Um, here's the thing, whenever we make an exposure, our x-ray tubes are, are so well balanced that once you make an exposure, if, um, if this was left to itself, if it had no breaks, our x-ray tube and our anode is so well balanced, it may rotate for hours. And if it rotates for hours, then what you have is this is rotating on some bearings that are going to get hot. So not only do you create heat here and deposit it there, but also the mechanical energy required to rotate this on those bearings creates heat itself in the form of friction. So uh, we can't get in and, and oil those things back up or replace them if they get worn out. So we, we don't want it to rotate indefinitely. We've done the damage that we're gonna do by sending the electrons across the tube. We're not gonna be creating any more heat. We just need to get rid of it at this point. So we don't want it to continue to rotate. So after we make our exposure, so you rotor up, you rotor up and it spins it, you make your exposure and the damage is done. So what's gonna happen is that these are going to fire, if they were firing in order going that way, after your exposure, they're gonna fire in order going that way to bring it from the 3000 RPMs, and that takes about one second on rotary uh, from 3,000 down to zero within one minute. And it's usually going to take about five seconds. It, it usually stops pretty quick, but it certainly, you don't, certainly don't want it rotating any more than one minute. So that's our electromagnetic device that we use in rotation of the anode, but we're also going to use electromagnetic devices in the auto transformer, auto transformers, electromagnetic device, step-up transformer, MA selector, the um, 
low voltage uh, transform, step down transform. Um, and there are a couple of other things that we're going to talk about as well. Um, diodes, we're going to talk about uh, rectifiers, we're going to talk about line voltage compensation, timer circuits. All of those things are two things electromagnetic devices and they are resistors in the overall circuit. So we'll pick up there on Wednesday of next week.